How's it going, everybody? This is David Palmer, the Leo King, and today I have a special guest, Teal Swan. She's an amazing spiritual guidance practitioner, YouTube host, beautiful sensation to the world, and I'm with her, her today to really go deep into the astrology and see how she feels about it and see if she can give us some guidance and where it's all going. How are you doing today, Teal? I'm doing wonderful. Um, so why don't you tell everybody what it is that you do? Basically, I'm a spiritual teacher. So that means that I try to take things which are intangible, these subtle influences, which those of us that are in this world know are not so subtle, but they're beyond the physical comprehension. And I try to make them translate in a way that can apply to our physical day-to-day -day life. So it's like we could we could talk about all these big universal truths, but how does that apply to me and my life and my job and my kids and my you know all of that? I try to bridge that gap for people, so that they can walk the path of their life in a more integrated way. That means soul, body, mind, all of it together in a cohesive unit moving forward. If I was to sum it up, that's what it would be. <laughs> I love it. Well, I think it's very important because especially in this new age that we're having and there's so many different beautiful tools out there, it's one thing to learn about them and hear about them and talk about them, but the other is applying it and manifesting with it and really sitting into your truth. And today I really want to set up where the astrology is and I would love to get your opinion and, and, and see what tools you can give us to actually you know apply that into our lives. So it's a very interesting time that we're in right now. There's this one aspect going on in astrology. It's called the Pluto-Uranus square. The last time we had this aspect was actually in 1929 with the Great Depression, yeah. where it, it's Pluto, the planet of change and revolutionary intensity with the change. Like It just brings death and rebirth, and it's making a hard aspect to Uranus. Uranus is a planet of rebellion. It's a planet of unpredictability. It's also a planet that you know, it deals with uh, innovation and, and making sure that you reinvent yourself. And it's happening in the signs of Capricorn and Aries. Pluto and Capricorn is changing the way that the system is done, the way that the rules are, and, and making sure that these old traditions sort of die, mm -hmm. while this hard aspect to Uranus and Aries is wanting freedom and rebellion and the understanding of self and to, to take action for yourself. And I've always looked at it as... Uh, you know, the old system is dying and the new one's being born, but there's pressure for people to find their purpose and to no longer be slaves to a system that, that no longer works and really own their individuality and own their, their identification of self. The way it played out in 1929 was it was actually Pluto and ca uh, Cancer and Uranus and Aries. So it was, we had no security. There was no safe home. There was no food on the table. There, you know, it was very hard. Now it's opposite. You can go to McDonald's and <laughs> get like a chicken McNugget or whatever and have all the security you want, yet nobody seems to be finding their true path. So we'll take that little astrological alignment and, uh, you know, see how you can uh, channel that for us. Well, I'm watching this play out in the world in a big way, especially with this conflict we're in right now with the Middle East. What we're watching all over the world is this huge conflict between new ways and old ways of doing things. So I'm watching these really old world religions collide with the way that the modern world is progressing. And it's like the final resistance, basically, before we tip over the scale into a whole new way of being. And if you take, like that's on a massive world scale, if you take it on an even smaller level, you've got just the education system, where you've got the old education system, which is very regimented, and it's designed to basically plug people into a machine. It's designed to create worker bees. And we're watching that the new beings that are coming into this earth are failing in that system, left and right. We've got more kids that are diagnosed ADD and ADHD, and regardless of whether we're going to look at the environmental factors of those kinds of things or not, what it is is that we've got a group of beings that, before coming into this reality, it's as if they're saying, I'm not going to fit into the square box you want to put me in, so I'm going to come in so that you can't make me conform to that. And when so many of them do that at once, Instead of making the children change, the whole education system will have to change. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and you're watching it on a personal level. I mean, it doesn't, everybody can look at their lives right now and look at the upheaval. It's like you'd be really hard-pressed to find somebody who can actually take a, an honest survey of their life and tell you that they don't feel like everything's up in the air. They don't maybe know what they're going to be doing in two years, one year, one month. 
it sort of is this unshakiness and it's pressing us into a space where we're having to look at what we can do to be okay with uncertainty in and of itself. Like where do I put my home if the external reality isn't safe, if the external reality isn't sure, and the more you read the news, of course, anybody who does that, the more you sort of start to feel like everything could collapse in, in a heartbeat. So if I can't put my stock in the external world, then I have to put my stock in the internal world. That causes us to become a lot more honest with ourselves, what we want, what we don't want, what we like, what we don't like. What's the truth for us? And so from a universal perspective, even though it seems like things are getting a little bit rocky, <laughs> it's sort of like you can't find stability unless you know what that rockiness is, right? Yeah. So the fact that it's forcing us to find ourselves in reality makes all of this stuff not only necessary, but an awesome part of this change. I like that. And you know, it's interesting because this Pluto and Capricorn, Capricorn's a sign of the goat where it wants to climb the mountain. And if you meet a Capricorn, they're really good at always, you know, business. And it's interesting to see the world have to change its business perspective, but on a deeper spiritual level, its ability to climb higher. So I like with what you say about the system needing to change and also where people are at that rocky point. Literally, Capricorn is rocky because it is a trail with a goat on the little trail. Have you ever seen those goats and how they climb all funky on the top of those mountains? Yeah. We're all having to do that, I feel. Like this spiritual evolution is causing people to climb higher. And you know what? We're, we're, co we're so comfy at this level <laughs> that it's like, it's, it's so funny to see how it's hard for people to get to realize that there's a higher mountain to climb now and it's bringing much more of a destiny for people and this deeper spiritual inner world that you speak of which i want to actually bridge to next with the astrological alignment is the planet neptune is in pisces the natural placement for neptune and pisces is a sign of spirituality but it also is the sign of unconsciousness and consciousness so you either you're either drunk and high or you're spiritually attuned so it's almost like the world is stoned, I like to say, or it's completely understanding and high vibrational. And it's a very, it's, it actually clears a bell to see the opposite. So how do you feel about that transit? Um, well, <laughs> I think that the, the sort of, I, I don't want to say paradox, it's almost like the duality has never been so clear uh, as it is right now on planet Earth, ever. I've never seen this. I've been observing exactly the same thing in my line of work where it's like there's no middle ground anymore. And you're watching this even on an economic level where the middle class is disappearing. The middle of everything is disappearing. And it's, it's catapulting us to decide which side of the fence we're going to be on. It's almost like the unconscious reality is about to fall away. And it's like we've, we're in this testing grounds where it's like, are you ready to excel? Are you ready to excel? Are you willing to admit that there's something missing, that there might be something more? So it's that internal calling that I'm seeing all the time. I'm observing exactly the same thing on a practical level, for sure. <laughs> And how do you, I mean, I'm just going to open it up because I don't think a lot of people are afraid to speak truth. That's the other part of this, which is Saturn is in Scorpio and Scorpio is a sign of truth. And it's been here since September of 2012, which I think is so ironic that the whole, you know, galactic shift of December 2012 has Saturn in Scorpio, this deep, like real truth. Like there, you can't BS things anymore. You can't put out a facade anymore. Your spiritual core is being exposed so powerfully but it's mixed with this Neptune and Pisces of where I feel, you know, you're either conscious or you're unconscious. Like it's, you can't be middle, like you say. But the other aspect of this is like, if you're in a very unconscious state, you know, it's going to expose itself in kind of dangerous, scary, and, you know, kind of harsh ways. Does that make sense at all? Oh, yeah. Like right now, the major call, and this is within the universe, and I, I don't know, but I want your opinion about what this looks like on an astrological level, but when you are outside of this dimension reading the blueprints for what is to come in this reality, what reads as the major calling, which could potentially be even like a hundred year transit, would be the calling for integration. That means that people cannot be split in terms of their consciousness. So when we look at human consciousness, you look at these dual aspects, one being the unconscious aspect of a person, and the other being the conscious aspect of a person. And so even a person who is conscious would have aspects of themselves that is unconscious. This is what, what Jung would refer to as the shadow work. So right now, when it comes to integration and this massive call to integrate, it's to become one. 
not only as a group consciousness, so as us as humans becoming one, but also becoming one with yourself. That means that you have to, in order to become one, you have to be willing to admit to the aspects that you had banished to the basement of your consciousness before. So, I mean, we all, I was talking about this the other day where this is how it applies in day-to-day -day life. So if you're going to move forward with your life completely, you have to bring all aspects with you, including what we would consider your baggage. So when you're first born into this reality and you are, you're coming into socialization, you start to learn that some aspects of yourself are unacceptable and other aspects are acceptable. So when we tend to, to learn that, we suppress the aspects that are not acceptable and that's what the subconscious mind essentially is. And so in order to move forward, we have to be really super honest with ourselves. So a good example is um, if you ask somebody the truth, do you love your husband or something like that? A person will often say, oh, yeah, of course I do. You know I love him, even though, you know, and they'll lift off all those other things. And what it is is they're not actually willing to go internally to their core aspect and ask what answer is the most close to that particular core. The answer could be no. And this is not about, we're not having an argument about true or false. Is it true or is it false that I love my husband? We're asking about what the dominant vibration is. And if you're unwilling to admit to some sometimes very grave truths about the way you actually feel, then there can be no progression. So in order to, when you're admitting, yes, this is the truth, even though it's really unsavory of me right here and now, then we can't take all of us with ourselves into the future. Does that sort of make sense? So that's the totally. integration process, basically, to make the unconscious conscious. And I see that being a major theme of our whole lifetimes, those of us that are alive and listening to this right now. <laughs> Well, it's actually very rare for humanity to go through this transit because Neptune's on a 160-year cycle around the sun. And so for it to come back home to Pisces, the last time was 1848 into 1860, you know, four, which in that time was the gold rush. It was like everybody got seduced into this unconsciousness of coming west for gold, but that wasn't, nobody struck gold. It was so funny. <laughs> like everybody, but we were called somewhere. And then it turned it actually into civil war, which I think is kind of interesting. But it, it, we, we haven't been through this transit since then. And this is also when psychics or spirituality came out very intensely. But it's so funny. If you look back at that history, it got shammed as, uh, you know, fortune tellers. So this is actually technically when the fortune teller came out uh, last time in humanity. And here it is coming out again. But... I think that we're polishing it right, and I think that you know uh, it's getting it's getting the recognition it needs. But so it's interesting to see these astrological transits. They're not you know everyday things. If you think of the world in 1999, which I know you and I were both alive for, it was not like this. It didn't feel this way. Consciousness wasn't even kind of the 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 big thing, if that makes sense, you know. Yeah, people were not made as uncomfortable by their lives. There was it's sort of like right now. There's an agitation because of the energies that are influencing us, we can feel the parts of ourselves that are out of alignment more. It used to be that a person sitting in a nine to five job wasn't caused the same amount of pain by that condition that they're caused today because of, of this major potential that's teasing us forward. I, I like sure that. I experienced that's... that same thing. It's like there was not as much contrast in people's lives back then. <laughs> And that's actually exactly what it is. I think you hit the nail on the head because if you look at these transits, having the pressure of Pluto Uranus, which we opened with, that cycle, the last time it happened was 1929. And you know what? It was very uncomfortable to live then. But the funny aspect of in between 1929 and 2011 and 12 when this transit started is the 60s, which is when Pluto and Uranus conjuncted, which means they were in the same position in Virgo, and that's when it set off this revolution. And here are the planets coming into the square positions to check up on that 60s. So it's almost like we're finally seeing what we seeded in the 60s of exactly. revolution and freedom finally getting the opportunity to make its calling here. Exactly, and I can, I can actually elaborate on why that is. In the, in the 60s, what we had was a, a massive consciousness shift where people were going in the direction of this brand new idea, but they were still so oriented in the direction of pushing against what they didn't want. Mm. Now what we have, because a lot of those people, by virtue of their resistance to certain things, like we all saw the feminist movement, so instead of that being a real blow for women's freedom, it became very anti-male. 
So a lot of those women couldn't even, in their own lifetime, partake in the freedom that they themselves had created. But the next generation, which is, of course, the progression of that consciousness, came down to the 60s generation. And now as they grow, you're watching the actual flowering of all of those things. So instead of facing towards and what we want to push against, we're facing the direction of what we want to create. And so you're definitely seeing the blooming, essentially, of what we did root or see in the 60s. Definitely. Yeah, and that's so crazy because it almost feels like uh, we thought we were really on that path, but we really weren't, you know. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> it's like, you know, that was such a crazy time. And here it is really seeing, um, and I'll be honest, there's a rebel in all of us, I think, that needs to come out. You know, you're going to have to rebel against that quote-unquote system a little bit. You're going to have to go against the grain. But it's interesting when you do it, it's like everything comes together. It's so weird. I, w I would definitely encourage people who, when you identify what it is that you have to basically rebel against, this, use that to decide what it is that you're for. Mm. And like the best way that you can rebel against a system is to pour all of your energy into whatever the opposite of that thing that you want to rebel against is. So like, right. let's say that we're rebelling against the pesticides or rebelling against GMOs or something like that. We should be pouring all of our focus, all of our energy and all of our creative energy specifically straight into like natural health products, organic products, getting things passed through legislation that mm. enables f healthy food to be carried in schools, stuff like that. Because we have to understand that wherever our focus is, is where we are lending our conscious energy to. We're literally creating whatever it is we're looking at. So the more that we look at something and scream, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this, the more you're actually feeding that. So it's like, it's a funny thing in PR, it's like, bad press is good press. Why? Because they're focused on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you bring up a great point because whenever you hear the word rebellion, most people think, oh my gosh, I need to pick a shovel and uh, a gun and go rebel. And I think you're bringing up amazing subjects with things that are happening with GMOs. And I mean, we can go on to every little subject, but we don't even need to, mm -hmm. that there's, there's a unique and, and a higher vibrational way to rebel. And I think you brought up a great way of doing that. And, and it's all within our own power. And that kind of leads me to, as we're setting up the chessboard right now of all the astrology, the planet Jupiter, which is the biggest planet, the fortune planet of expansion and greatness. I call him Santa Claus up there in space. He just moved into Leo, which is the sign of love, but it's self-love. It's about real, true, high vibration of your core because it, uh, Leo is ruled by the sun. So it's where the core of our soul is. It's where the expression of happiness comes from. And have Jupiter here, which is all about new opportunities and new roads and new, you know, expansion has just here this summer in July coming to Leo in the middle of all this that we're talking about, which is to find self-love in the middle of this kind of intense, you know, time that you we're talking about. How do you feel about that? I am probably the most obsessed spiritual teacher when it comes to self-love. In fact, the book I just barely wrote that's getting published and put out in next May is on self-love. That's the whole mm. subject. It's like the root around which everything grows. There's That's basically the best way to put self-love because if you're going to understand the laws of the universe, it's that whatever is taking place inside is going to mirror externally. So we could go externally and try to change everything, try to get that person to love us, try to get that job to accept us, or else we could go internally and basically get ourselves into the vibration of that thing. It's not like we can't accept love from other people. What it is is that if we are showing ourselves love, we are actually emitting a frequency that like a radio channel dial, it's like you're tuning yourself to love and then it will start coming in from all angles. So that old adage where it's like, in order to find love, you have to love yourself. It's sort of obnoxious and super cliche, but there is an actual vibrational reason for that saying. It's that whatever vibration you are currently holding will be matched exactly in your external reality. And so, like earlier on when I was just explaining that with the energies and influences, we're being driven back towards ourselves and using ourselves as the anchor and using ourselves in a way where we can recognize the universe within. This is just the natural progression of that very same thing. What is love? Many of us have to ask this question because right now, and in, in the way it has been going for thousands of years, is that we don't actually know what love is. You've got mm -hmm. parents that are, are saying, I'm worrying and I'm telling you exactly what you need to do because I love you. And we're like, wow, okay, now this just skewed with my head because that means worry is love. That means sacrifice is love. That means, see how it's like sullied? 
we're in this reality where love has become poisoned by the concepts which humanity has attached to love. And when we set out on this sort of journey of our own of figuring out how to love ourselves, we figure out what love really is and what love isn't. And when we start providing ourselves with the real, authentic version of love, you're going to notice this major shift happen within society itself. People are going to know how to love. They're going to know exactly what to do for each other. It's not going to be this confused, sort of poisonous spin anymore. So that's, a, it's, I mean, look at what that could do for a reality. We could have intentional communities that are really functioning. We could have, we could do away ultimately, potentially in the future, with hierarchy. I mean, how amazing would that be if we could actually create a reality where there was no government oppression, where there was no, you know, corporate oppression, whatever that oppression is, it would be absent if we understood love, because love is a direct opposite to the concept of fear. And of course, fear is what breeds these power struggles and controls. The minute a person says, I need to be on top of someone or else I'm below them, you've done away with love. So the yeah. more that we figure out love, the more that those, those, um, like you could call them vertical relationships where one person's on top and one person is underneath, they're going to be gone. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting, this whole self-love thing and how the universe represents it because Leo is ruled by the sun and the sun is a good example. He doesn't move an inch and all the planets revolve around him okay, or her. But like it just shines its brightness and nobody is coming to the sun's aid to help it be more bright or tell it to be anything. It just is knowing its love, knowing its brightness, and all the planets come around and want a piece of it. Now, planets like Neptune and Pluto, they're like, I don't want it so bright. So when the, I always call it, the audience starts to heckle, ah, oh, it's too bright. The sun doesn't turn off its light and go, oh, sorry, I'm going to turn down my love for you. You know, the sun goes, oh, I'm just going to continue this. And believe, this is a separate subject, but to me, the sun is the projector of this reality. I mean, literally, it's where the core of all these multi dimensions are coming out of. So I think it's so important to understand how the sun is. But also, the sun rules the heart in the body in astrology. And so nothing tells the heart or gives any aid to the heart. The heart just has to pump the whole body and keep it going, including the mind. Without the heart, the mind's dead. So this is the core of it all. Like you, I like how you bring up the root of it all is this self-love. And it is. And to see the universe set this up. Even though I think that as we've been on this spiritual evolution, self-love has always been important. But it's so funny that the universe now brings it in hard with Jupiter, the biggest planet, and really shows you, because Jupiter's a planet of teaching and knowledge, it will expose, as it's making a hard square to Saturn and Scorpio, this truth, if you really love yourself or not, in the middle of when it's getting uncomfortable, in the middle of when the pressure's on, and now it's really going to hit people hard. And so this is... It can be very hard for some people, and I think self-love is the deepest answer for it all. I agree. I, I wanted to add something interesting to what you said about the sun earlier. So hmm. when we look at a galaxy specifically, or even a, a dimension, a time-space reality, the black hole that is at the center of that particular galaxy is actually the birthplace. You can look at it as the birth canal, essentially, of the entire universe. So what you have in a dimension that's based on duality is light and dark aspects. The female is actually representative of the potential energy of the dark aspect. The male is the light aspect. So the sun is actually the counterpoint energy to the black hole, which is the female. Mm. The sun is male. I know. I always say that, though, because I get so much flack when I <laughs> say it's a guy. <laughs> Everybody's like, well, you can have my but in, in astrology, it is male. You're, you're right. It is male. So Leo is male, too. <laughs> like you guys you gotta hold off because the women get the black hole <laughs> <laughs> literally I know. and you know what so i love that you bridge this galactically because i hate the term astrology and i actually hate being called an astrologer because when people call me that i'm like no i don't just sit and do old 80s horoscopes all day like that is not what i'm doing like because i'm a galactic astrologer because 2012 and i want to bridge this to 2012 because astrology actually understands where we're at galactic shifting. Yeah. And to me, December 21st, 2012 was the point, was the galactic shift point. If we look at where the sun was in the galaxy, it reached center point in the center of the galaxy, and now it's rising towards this next 6,000 years of positive energy. So what do you feel about the whole galactic shift, and, and how do you feel that's connected to what's happening now? 
Oh, immensely. I sort of, what I saw that date as is almost like you go to pretend you're on a roller coaster and you're at the apex, the highest that the roller coaster goes, and you're just barely feeling that sensation before you go right on this basic ride, which we have prepaved. It's like a predestined ride we decided on before even coming into this life, even, you know, potentially generation upon generation before this, because Lord knows these things are prepaved, you know, sometimes thousands know. of years in advance. But, um... What I would say is that what's interesting about history, like even, let's just take it on a real practical level. When we look back at historical events like World War II or whatever, often when we were in the middle of it, when we thought that the war began, actually didn't signify or wasn't, wasn't represented by that exact event that we think was the start of it. It was set in motion a long time before that. So 2012, that apex, basically, was one of those things where if you were really attuned to subtle energies, of course you felt that that was the, the major apex or the huge ignition. But it's not going to feel like it because we're sensation junkies. We're going to more identify with the extreme manifestations when they finally manifest and not that initial sort of thing, you know. It's kind of like if we, if let's say that, that we potentially get into World War III, right? When we turn around and we look back at it, we're going to not notice the first bomb that was dropped between us and the Middle East as the beginning of World War III. History will show that the very beginning might potentially even be all the way back when, when the um, planes ran into the Twin Towers. But you see how it, like, it sort yeah. of runs that way? So it's upon reflection that we're going to see that that date was in fact the date where it was all set off basically it's very true especially the subtlety i think that you bring up of this is a long transit galactically the galactic calendar is much longer i mean it takes 220 million years for the sun to just go one turn around our galaxy so I mean, like on that calendar it's like okay let's start looking at our watches i mean even though that was the big moment this is a long roller coaster ride, and but to be alive during the beginning of it, front seat, front row, gives you every opportunity to have the best, in my opinion, spiritual karmic cycle that you could ever ask for. Like this is the one that could set you in motion. And I'm the one who believes in connecting with the future and the past to make your present very powerful. And uh, this is just the time I call it. Like you have your moment now to really make your greatest, you know, highest calling come together and this beautiful reality to make it all real for you. Like, and you could do anything you want now. This is, I mean, 20 years ago, you and I couldn't have had this conversation and done this. And, you know, I mean, we're so lucky right now. And I think what the astrology shows is there is so much pressure that it creates a diamond. It creates the greatest experience you can ever have. And um, I'm just so excited to be alive for this. And how do you feel, um, what is your greatest tool that you feel that people can use to, to, to come into that powerful and empowering energy? You know, ironically, it would be, I actually offer this process, which is, it seems like a really sort of trite self-help technique but it's like the mothership. <laughs> it's basically to live your life according to the question, what would someone who loved themselves do? Because mm -hmm. most of us, I, honestly, you're hard pressed to find somebody on this earth who 100% loves themselves, you know? So, and if the people who really don't love themselves, they don't know what that even means. And so if we can start asking ourselves that question about everything, so I mean, you decide between this thing at the supermarket and that thing at the supermarket, what would someone who loved themselves do? knowing that every time the answer to that question comes, you're going in the direction of your highest good. Now we, and we have to, it forces us also to get in touch with our intuition, because you're not going to know why that's the answer sometimes. So like if you asked yourself, what would someone who loved themselves do, a donut or a, or a carrot? People who are like involving their brain in it might say, well obviously someone who loved themselves more would, would eat a carrot, but that might not necessarily be the case for you. So if we're going to remove our mind from it and ask our, our intuition, so I'm, let's say that I'm forced with a big decision. So I want this to be small and big decisions. On a big decision, do I quit my job or do I keep it? What would someone who loved themselves do? 
you don't need to know why the answer is what it is, but intuitively, the second you ask that question, it's like you get a hit in your heart center. You know what the answer is. Mm. And then it's all about the bravery to act on whatever answer you receive. And that is scary as hell. So it's like, even though this sounds like a really sweet little, oh, what a fun little practice, like an affirmation. Hell no. Wait until you get in the middle of this. It's like the, one of the hardest things you'll ever do because of the kinds of decisions you have to make for yourself. I like that. Yeah. Now, relationship-wise, everybody wants to know this, especially being an astrologer. That's always my number one thing. It's always like, oh, what's relationships, you know? And it's interesting because Venus represents relationships in astrology. And Venus has been on a, you know, kind of a weird turn. Uh, this beginning of the year, uh, in 2014, January, we had Venus go retrograde in Capricorn. Oh, and uh, that's a sign of, uh, you know, just work. <laughs> it's a sign of, like, Business, go to the mountain, destiny. So it's interesting to see that Venus did a huge retrograde here, and then it was in the middle of some hard aspects. And now we're, you know, Venus direct all the way until it comes into Virgo Leo and this time next year. So I always look at that as like, because if we look at Venus, it does the star pattern in the sky. And I feel like when I look at these turns of the corner of Venus now, you know, creating the star. That, to me, is what the next cycle is with relationships. Now, that's not in any astrology book or anything, but I channel that from the universe when I do my astrology. So we just had to start this year on a long year and a half relationship transit of destiny and really looking if it's pathly correct. And, you know, as it's a deep tie of a Scorpio in truth, like, sex is involved. And if there's really the passion there that's really going to connect with this love, because now Jupiter's in Leo, so... It's really asking for like the best of the best or not at all. Like, how do you feel relationships are right now? Or what do you feel that's out there universally with relationships? I feel there's an overhaul in terms of our consciousness relative to relationships. You have watched this trend since the 20s where relationships, because before then relationships used to be just like a, a lifestyle arrangement. It used to just be for the benefit of the family. In the 20s, there was this, we entered this romantic era where basically you come into a space where you want to marry the person that you fall in love with, not just the person who you are supposed to be with because of family connections or whatever. But with that progression came this sort of ignorance, I guess, about what relationships really are universally. So we started to look towards relationships in the same way that we look towards pot or prescription pills, where it's like, this is going to be the answer that makes me feel good, is this person. And so by being in these romantic positions, we gave our power away completely, where universally relationships are the best mirroring that you can get. So when it comes to soul progression, that's ultimately what, what a relationship is. It's that this person who you let the closest to you will become the biggest mirror for you. And so it will magnify whatever shadows you have and magnify whatever light you have. And so now because our relationships are becoming so uncomfortable and because it's obvious that you know just marrying a person doesn't mean your life's going to be happy. Sometimes it's just the opposite. It makes your life more miserable. Now we're having to look at relationships for what they really are and we're, we're doing away with the illusion that it should always feel good. And so I'm watching this, this thing happen where even though the divorce rates are like skyrocketing, People are becoming more aware of the fact that it's an opportunity in relationships to work through their own things instead of make their happiness completely dependent on another person. Yeah, I like that. That's Well, that's been my story. <laughs> but I've been single now for a couple years because of it. I've been working on me, you know, and uh, I feel that relationships now... That they're not like they used to be. Uh, there's a good example. I live in Hollywood, so uh -oh. believe it or not... <laughs> There is no such thing as relationships in Hollywood. It's crazy. No, I believe it. Like, like, you know, dating out here on the scene, like, like Tinder's big and, you know, people just, it's like cool now to just be like, hey, let's just go out and have a drink. And if we end up making out and then if I talk to you in four weeks, whatever, like that's dating in LA. Now, like, so for me, I think I'm a little skewed because it's like, yes, there's are. no more longer this loving, like old school marriage partnership thing anywhere. Like you can't even access it anywhere. It's pretty crazy. And the ones that do want it, you're kind of like creepy, <laughs> you know, like, wink, 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 wink. Like, you know, it's like, okay, that's a little too much. So I think maybe I'm a little skewed, but I don't know. I'm wondering, is that the new time we're coming into? I don't know. I, you know, 
No, that's a microcosm. What's happening is a major magnification of the shadows of that particular area. I could talk to you about Los Angeles all day long, but what it is is that you've got a microcosm of people that are incredibly afraid of intimacy and don't even know what intimacy is. Intimacy, we could shorten down into the world, into the words into me see. It's the willingness yeah. to let yourself get so close to somebody that you are receiving all of who they are. And in a place that is obsessed with, with looks, nowhere, I mean, it's perfect that you're where you are, obviously, because of what people need there, but almost nowhere in the world can you find just the extreme attachment to the ego self, which is the attachment to the light side and the blatant non or unwillingness to acknowledge the shadow aspect because it's all about image. I have to portray exactly who I want you to see that I am. And that is the exact opposition to what it takes to make an authentic relationship. So I, I think nowhere will it be more difficult to achieve the new paradigm of relationships than there. So what, what you're basically seated in, a, seated in a pocket of the last holdout, basically. <laughs> I'm in the middle of the beast. Well, it's interesting. Let's go back to Saturn and Scorpio, which... Intimacy is, even though I'm in Hollywood and I will agree, yes, it's horrible here. And that is, you exactly nailed it. It's funny that that same astrological alignment is actually happening everywhere else though. And we're at the end of it. By the end of this year and the beginning of next year, when Saturn comes back into Scorpio and finishes, we're done with the intimacy transit. But Saturn is a planet of restriction and work and, you know, making decisions in this space. So I would say that the intimacy factor has been very intense, but I would say you're right, it's amplified in Hollywood like 10 times more. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you feel about that? Do you feel that you see that around the world as well, that there is an intimacy factor involved too? Yes, and it's, it's polarized. It's like the, what we were talking about earlier. It's like the, the middle of ground is disappearing and either people are like they are in Hollywood siding completely with the aspect of like let's get as far away from people as possible or they're doing the opposite which is coming straight into like pure authentic relationships and mm -hmm. what you're watching the manifestation of this worldwide if you want that as aside from just in LA is actually the, the technological relationship era so as it's easy for us when we have a fear of intimacy to create intimate relationships online where we can just shut it down at the first sign of, of discomfort <laughs> done See you. <laughs> Later. <laughs> See you, Teal. Bye. <laughs> <Yes>. It is true. <laughs> and that's just going. And I've looked at technology as this weird manifestation of how we're spiritually, like the, how powerfully spirituality is opening up the doors. If we watch, you know, one minute, you know, we have an old phone. The next minute it has my location and all these things like spirituality is rapidly accelerating the same way technology is. I think it's just a manifestation of where we're at spiritually. Yes. And, and this is such a crazy time. And relationships, you know, you are right. They are the biggest mirrors. And we just finished a huge Libra transit over the last four years. We had Saturn there. We just finished with Mars here. So to be honest with you, the karma around Libra, which represents mirroring or relationships or balance, is done. So it's almost like, you can have a great handshake and an agreement now and a great union. But what Saturn and Scorpio, Scorpio is asking is, is that commitment everything? Is that emotional depth exactly what you want to receive in? Because Scorpio is white or black and that's why it's separating this middle is because in Scorpio, you can't have an orgasm that's middly good. You can only have an orgasm that's all the way or nothing. Like there's no in between and it's coming down to orgasms now. I hate to say that, but like you can have great mirroring relationships now. But you, at the end of the day, it's like, gosh, it's not really giving me everything I want. And that's where we're at spiritually is, okay, I can set up nice mirrors, but like which one really is going to hit my mirror great and deep? And that's what kind of makes this really confusing, I think, for people is you can have great mirrors, but gosh, is it everything you want back? And it's okay to want. That's where the astrology is going is in hunger, or I always call it in astrology, the vampire aspect. There's a vampire part of ourselves that can no longer be eating the rats. I use the analogy of interview with the vampire with Brad Pitt because he just didn't want to become a vampire. He's like, no, 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 I, I can't do it. But there's Tom Cruise sipping on the wine of blood and doing it all. And I know I'm using a harsh analogy, but there's a side of people now that have to face harsh truth and depth. And are you really getting out of this reality and these relationships and your core of where you invest your life 
Is it bringing you everything that you need in return? And uh, that's what the next you know, eight, nine months are about with Mars, I mean, uh, with Saturn and Scorpio and Jupiter and Leo. Those are the two signs of sex and heart, death and birth, life and, and everything and transformation and core. And it, 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 it's the most extreme transit you can have. So yeah. how do you feel about that? Well, I think you elaborate. I mean, I don't really need to elaborate on that one. You totally said everything perfect. So it's like, that's exactly what's going on. My, I would have a question for you. Yeah. So I'm feeling this this massive honesty vibe in the universe. Do you see any like astrological alignment that vibes with that particular? Yeah, exactly what we're talking about. Saturn in Scorpio is just truth like scorpios expose it all like they know if you're lying right away like hey <laughs> it's like stop lying to me but with saturn there it's like it's called boundaries that we're seeing the boundary lines it's like no longer you know are the states kind of run the way they are in the the universe anymore it's like in order to, to find new boundaries it all needs to come out we need to see every little piece of it all we need to see everything and that honesty aspect is saturn with integrity if you're honest, you can set correct boundaries and gosh, it'll be great. But you don't want to become a little state. You want to become big like California or Texas and be honest and see all the boundaries and be so few, you know, and have the greatest amount of your spiritual land that you can have. And if you're not honest and you're not in that integrity, you're you're setting yourself up for failure and to not receive what you want. It's making commitments to things you don't really want. You know, you're making commitments to bull crap, or I like to call it hoarders. If you ever notice a hoarder, they're hoarding on to everything that really isn't even valuable anymore because they're trying to hold on to this identification of something that gives them really the depth or truth of what they need. And that's where we're at, I would say, spiritually. And the only way to access that heart is to be honest because I use the example of sex. If the orgasm sucks, you're probably not going to be very happy. It's probably just going to be like, oh, gosh, you know, like, and you get left with that honesty where you have to, are you going to step up to the plate and be like, you know what? We just don't have a connection. We just don't, we just don't fully integrate all the way. It's 85% and that's great, but I'm looking for 100. And I think that's where we're at now, just... And that can come in every form, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. It makes sense. <laughs> you know, and, that, and that's where we, where we are. Well, it's been really amazing talking with you today. I'm so happy to meet you. You're such an amazing person. I've loved your videos. I've been following you. I've supported it. Um, and, you know, you always pop up recommended all the time. And, and you really are doing something very special for humanity in this, in this time, in this spiritual evolution. And, you know, it's been a true pleasure to get to know you today. You know, and do you have any uh, last words for people out there today? No, but I'm out of, it's interesting that you said you were in Los Angeles because I'm going to actually be there. I'm holding a workshop in LA next month. So Wonderful. If anybody wants to attend that, it's really super awesome. I, I hold these workshops called synchronization workshops where people come together and it's like I, I have people ask questions. They come up on stage and I work them through whatever issue they're going through, knowing that that applies to the rest of the audience as well. So if anybody's interested in that, um, they can visit my website, www.tealswan.com, and the first thing on that main page is going to be events, and so you'll be able to see where we're hosting it, what the exact date is, because of course I'm not on top of my own schedule, but yeah. <laughs> and what sign are you? I'm a Gemini. Oh, boom, giving all the information out. Yeah. <laughs> That's exciting. Well, yeah, it's been such a pleasure, and how do people find your videos? Well, on YouTube, I think it's the Spiritual Catalyst channel, but my series is called Ask Teal. So people will submit questions, and then I select a question, and I do a video answer format every Saturday on, any, on a different subject. And I've got hundreds and hundreds at this point. So if you go to YouTube and you type in Teal Swan, you'll get hit with all these videos, and you can just pick on whatever one is good for you. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Teal. I, I really appreciate you, and I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.